Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. And now to your hosts, Ken Jakes and Julie Johnson. Welcome to SIPE's new weekly podcast, Democracy That Delivers. My name is Ken Jakes, and I'm the Director of Communications here at SIPE. I'm joined by our Senior Communications Manager, Julie Johnson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. You know, Julie and I come across a lot of interesting and fascinating people uh, in our line of work, and we wanted to share some of the experiences with you. So we decided to start a podcast to share the insights and experience of these fascinating people. We're... Uh, joined today by Sarah Thorne. She's the Senior Director uh, for International Trade at Walmart. Hi, how are you? I'm well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's so many things we want to talk to you about today. Um, First of all, tell us about your position at Walmart and and how that came about and and what, what you really do there. So I work in our Washington office and I represent the company's views on international policy issues. Uh, that largely means our trade issues, supply chain issues, and increasingly our responsible sourcing initiatives. Um, and so it's an intersection of policy and corporate responsibility, but really our primary, the folks we're primary talking to are the U.S. government, whether it's the administration or the Hill, so that they can um, understand with one, sort of have one policy person that they're talking to one-stop shopping. Oh, great. I know Walmart's an industry leader, Sarah, in terms of their focus on uh, sustainable development goals, the UN sustainable development goals, and uh, corporate social responsibility. So what are Walmart's main goals in terms of improving economic conditions in emerging markets where you're operating? Sure. So, you know, our journey through corporate responsibility has taken uh, a little while. And we really started thinking more about the role that Walmart could play in tackling societal issues with the issue of sustainability. And the, the approach we took was to look at both what the company could do through our own operations, uh, but also how we could use philanthropy catalytically and strategically to assist that. Um, And so, you know, we looked at issues like waste is a good example um, and said, you know, what can we do as a company and through our supply chain to reduce waste? So things like reducing the packaging sizes. I don't know if you remember, but years ago, even deodorant used to come in a big cardboard box. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what can we do together with industry to actually make a difference on, on environmental sustainability? And I would say, you know, our uh, ability to make dramatic change, both in terms of renewable energy, reducing waste, creating sustainable products, made us really think about this uh, opportunity for systems change. And we've evolved to think more about, as we now are a global company in 28 markets, what's our role in creating that system change for environmental issues, but also social issues um, throughout our global value chain. So when we look at the, you know, the UN um, and the SDGs, we really think about systems change mm-hmm. and where can we use the business, where can we use philanthropy strategically, um, but also how do we work collaboratively with other partners in industry, in government, NGOs, towards these goals, which really are about um, increased opportunity for for underserved populations, poverty reduction, and then a healthier, or more sustainable planet. Uh, Sarah, you mentioned you're in 28 markets worldwide. What's your largest market? So right now, the United States. Right. Uh, we still have we have 4,000 stores in the United States, but we now have more stores outside of the United States than inside the United States. So what um, percentage of profits is is still the United States, obviously? Still is our biggest market. Biggest market, yeah. Um, but about a third of our revenue now comes Really? That outside. much? <laughs> and when did you start uh, moving overseas? So our first operations were in Mexico about, I believe, about 25 years ago. We're okay. still a new and fairly young multinational global company um, and have moved into additional markets largely in the last 15, 20 years. What kinds of stores do you mainly have overseas? So people would be surprised, but they're largely grocery stores. Mm. and Just we, groceries? Grocery, we have lots of formats and a lot of banners. So you may not go to Central America and see a Walmart. You may see a país. Oh, okay. um, so And you may see Leader in Chile. So lots of different banners, lots of different formats. Some of them are the large hypermarkets. But we have everything from a large hypermarket down to a small sort of bodega type store. But uh, predominantly, the, it's a food offering with some general merchandise as well. 
And, and what in, about in terms of job growth in some of your foreign markets? Uh, uh, what, what type of jobs have been created in, in some of these markets? You mentioned uh, South and Central America. Yeah, so retail is a great entry point for a lot of folks. We have over 2.1 million people who work with our company, directly for our company. Um, and what we found is it's a great start uh, for many jobs, both, you know, if you look in the United States, um, I think about 70% of our managers come from our hourly pool and that we hold that pretty closely internationally. Um, and what we find is you can train for great skills, um, customer service, inventory management, accounting. These are skills that work for us as people move up in our industry, but also out into other fields. And so we've actually invested heavily in retail training um, so that we can get more folks who maybe have never worked in the formal economy into our stores. And it's obviously in Walmart's interest to contribute to a, a healthy business environment where you're operating both for other small business, you know, for consumers. What do you do? What kinds of um, uh, partnerships or um, programs do you have that contributes to those environments? That's a great question. So as you rightly say, we want to have healthy ecosystems around our stores. And we find the best way to do that is to leverage our assets again. So we buy a lot and we hire a lot of folks. And so our investments really are about how do we do local sourcing effectively in the markets that we serve, and then how do we create opportunities for people to work with us or in our supply chain and work well. So we've invested quite a bit over the last several years in farmer training so that we can source, because we are a grocer, so that we can source locally for predominantly horticulture products where we can really link in pretty well to existing development programs where they're training farmers. But we can tell them, look, this is what the market wants. You should be planting cilantro and onions because we have a cycle here. And then what is the cycle for those? And what are the standards? And to create that transparency to the market for farmers, which we find is often lacking, because many farmers in emerging economies will have maybe one point of entry to the formal economy. It might be a wet market. It might be a coyote in Central America. If we can create better linkages to formal markets, they have better transparency to understanding how what's the right price, what are the right standards. Um, we also do quite a bit of work training uh, SMEs. We have a strong program focused on sourcing from women-owned businesses in particular as an underserved population. And I've learned an awful lot about what, how to help SMEs enter formal value chains. And then finally, like I said, about training. So we train uh, women in factories. We've done a lot of the farmer training and also training for your first job. See, I think it's a very interesting point because a lot of people, when they listen to a show like this and they hear about retailers like Walmart. They think of job creation as just people working in those stores, but it's a lot more than that. It's working with your partners there, your producers, uh, you know, people, lo lo local producers, not only of just produce, but, but other things that could be sold in the stores as well, correct? Correct. And it makes sense for us because if you think of it again, we're looking at really the whole system and impact. So local sourcing makes sense for a whole variety of reasons. You get a fresher product, you may get a better price locally. Um, you also and you're creating create jobs. Jobs and competition in the marketplace. And then you think about food miles for certain products as well. So for us, really trying to create that robust and healthy ecosystem. And then it doesn't hurt to have people in the community with more disposable income, um, both to shop in our stores, but also for development. Let's step back a, a little bit and find out a little bit more about Sarah Thorne. What did you do before you came to Walmart? How did you get involved in international trade? What what, what about it do you, do, do you really enjoy? So I am a total wonk. I love trade and I love mm -hmm. policy. Um, and I found that out when I was in graduate school. I went to a school called... Where did you, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. The Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy mm -hmm. and took my first international trade course and... I was like, this makes so much sense to me. Um, I took a bit of a circuitous route. Most people in my position have worked at the U.S. Trade Representative's office or on the Hill. I instead was always intrigued a little bit more by the cultural side and cultural diplomacy. So I came to Washington first as a presidential management fellow. Uh, Where are you from originally? Rhode Island. Rhode Island. But working for what's now the State Department Bureau of Educational Cultural Affairs. Um, and then was fortunate to kind of step out of government and go into the private sector, uh, working for a small electronics company doing trade, and then moved over to the Grocery Manufacturers Association and from there to Walmart. So kind of came into it through learning by doing as opposed to what most people tend to do is exit to businesses from. So when you worked at 
those uh, organizations, did you lobby the Hill? Were you government representative? It was. It was, okay. Hill, testimony, working in coalitions, the same sort of skill sets that we use now at at Walmart, but it's just a different perspective. And that also includes working with probably Department of Commerce and trade reps. Trade reps, exactly. Yeah, uh, uh, trade delegations coming in and out and and that type of thing. Right. So when did you start at Walmart? I started um, nine years ago. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen a lot of change in that time, obviously, with the overseas expansion. Absolutely. And it's been a fascinating job and a great place to work because I think um, it's still a it's still a very um, flat organization in some ways. Um, And there's a lot of empowerment of the individuals who work at Walmart to make decisions. And so it's been unique to be in a government relations perspective and not have people saying you can't do that. But how do we get you to yes in terms of, you know, working for me to have a policy hat, but also be able to work on these corporate responsibility initiatives is creating kind of a new field where, you know, we'll have our executives in international markets promoting the work we're doing in corporate responsibility because I think society expects that of us now as a business. Absolutely. You can't just silo it. You can't just be a global entity and not understand your impact on the world. And so creating this sort of new discipline as a government relations perspective, you know, who has a link into the foundation, who's working to create better leverage with governments and international organizations, um, creates, a, I think, makes us better represent- representatives of the company. And you mentioned earlier that you've learned a lot about what helps SMEs enter the formal sector, and that's something that's of a lot of interest to us here at SIP, you know, the informal sector and creating conditions to move into the formal sector. What have you learned about the ways to help SMEs so do that? One of the things that I think is perhaps the most important thing we learned was where to where to invest and where to interact. And I'll say, I think when we first came into this area of women's economic empowerment, we thought we kind of thought we'd work with women everywhere. And in some of the most compelling stories are the women very much at the base of the pyramid who may be selling one small handicraft item or really starting to emerge. Sarah, where exactly? Uh, give us a couple examples where uh, geographically are you talking about? So we're working in all of our markets of, and then okay. in our sourcing markets as okay. well. So it's just not in one place. No, it's everywhere. but I mean, I said, I think for a theme, we really thought we would help all the way from the base of the pyramid up from sourcing. And what we learned was it's probably better for us to work with a certain emerging SMA, to work that the the gap between our standards and where these small and emerging businesses might be could be too big for the smallest of the small to actually be a supplier to Walmart. That it was better to work with small enterprises who might already have a barcode, who may be selling to one or two stores, but could we could help scale. Um, in that sometimes working with the smallest of the small, because they're doing such tiny orders, because they need to have an ethical standards audit and a barcode and liability insurance and shipping and logistics, that that's a really hard thing to ask a very small producer to do. So it might be better for those smallest of the small to work with us very locally in a local market and then work with the more emerging businesses in both international trade and then in a bigger, broader scale skew of our assortment to us. And how about working with governments on regulatory f- reform to create the environment where these women can really thrive? Is that something you've focused on? Um, has that been something that you've found has been really effective? Or are you focusing more on helping individuals at the So at I don't think you can level? separate it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the more that we've learned is that there's not one intervention that's going to help. You really need to take what we call an ecosystem approach. So the issues facing many of these small businesses and then women tend to be smaller so they're more acute for them are issues like access to finance, understanding logistics and distribution, packaging. It's a big issue for a lot of these small businesses. How do I have packaging that looks the same or better than a you know a large CPG? How about business licensing, the creating the business you can help with that as well. And opportunities. Um, but if you can't in you know the World Bank just came out with a really interesting story study on gender and the law. So if you can't have a business license, if your husband is, can tell you whether you're not, you can actually work, um, you're not even going to get to the first step. Um, so we're starting to look at all of these issues together to say, you know, unfortunately, I think in the, sort of the history of development, a lot of the assistance to women went to primary issues, education, child maternal health. And we've seen a tremendous shift over the last 
five to six years where you're starting to see women as economic agents and actors because the benefits when you empower a woman, she's going to invest in her family and community, and you just get a very strong development outcome. And so we're, we're really thrilled to see this evolution that I hope and I think companies like Walmart and Coca-Cola and Goldman Sachs, who are sort of early investors in women's economic empowerment, have helped to shape. Uh, you mentioned Coca-Cola and other companies. Do you work as a coalition through business associations to lobby uh, foreign governments in some of these issues that you're talking about? Or do you work individually um, just through Walmart to, to, to make some of these changes? So we work – I wouldn't say lobby because I think in this issue, we're still educating and we okay. don't have all the answers. <laughs> we're still working to, you know, one of the things we did is we made a pledge to double our sourcing from women owned businesses uh, without a real cl- clear path on how we were going to do that. And so we've been learning as we were going, as we're going and learning with governments. But I will say there are um, areas where we work collectively with governments like APEC that has had historically a Women in the Economy Forum, where these issues can be brought to the surface. Um, With governments like the government of Peru, that'll have big forum where we can bring these issues out and talk about, here's what we've learned with the Clinton Global Initiative, where I think it's just as important to celebrate our successes, but also some of our failures and lessons learned. And I, I think that's something that, as Walmart, we've tried to be super transparent about what we've learned, where we've, where we're going, uh, where we've made mistakes. Because if if we were all doing this perfectly, there wouldn't be poverty. So clearly, there's still a long way to go. Uh, but at these convening forums, I think, are really important. And how do you identify partners to work with, Sarah? Is it a combination of you sort of have a strategic process you go through? Is it also just um, opportunity that arises? And are there certain criteria that you use for how you select partners and how you work with them? So I think for us, it's a, it's been evolution. But right now, we start with a a theory of change. So what do we want to achieve? Uh, Right now, we're looking really more comprehensively at geographies, value chains, and social and economic issues um, and environmental issues. And so when we identify how we're moving in these various areas, what we identify oftentimes is that we can't do it all alone, almost 100% that we'll need a partner. And so I'll give you an example. We're working on um, cashews in West Africa to try to change the dynamic where we can have more processing in West Africa as opposed to harvesting, shipping, and roasting outside. So keep the value there. Well, one of the things we identified was access to finance. The processors needed finance. So then we can find a partner to help us with more affordable capital training the farmers in good agricultural practices. Okay, well, can we find a partner can do that? Um, In all of our partnerships, uniformly, you need to have a mutual goal that you have to agree up front and recheck and recheck. Um, Because I think sometimes people come to us and say, well, you're good at logistics, let's partner. Well, we're good at logistics. We may not need a partner to help us with logistics, but we may not be great at training farmers. So we'll need to find that mutual beneficial goal where we're all working in concert. And we do lots of different types of partnerships. Some of them are multi-stakeholder. Some of them might be a foundation grant. Some of them may be knowledge sharing. And sometimes it's, we'd really like your business to buy this product. And those, I think, are all really important elements of partnership. Sarah, let's bring the conversation back to Washington now, and in particular on Capitol Hill. Uh, trade is a massive issue right now, and I'm sure it is for Walmart. I mean, you're, you just spoke very clear about what you're doing overseas in 28 markets. Tell me some of the issues on trade that you're working with on the Hill right now that's very important to Walmart. So I think the number one issue is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We see enormous value in the TPP. Um, many people would think the first thing we'd want to talk about is imports, but it's actually not. It's exports. We have uh, through nearly 350 stores in Japan. Those are largely grocery stores. And the tariffs, as you know, agricultural tariffs are extraordinarily high. Uh, and so we see huge benefit for our customers in Japan um, to lower their grocery bill, which is sort of a fundamental right, I think, and uh, to increase choice and opportunity. Um, And then also the rule of law. So there's really good new rules on investment protections for us on things like state-owned enterprises um, and the opportunity to provide services through global e-commerce. 
Um, and so we see the opportunity through the TPP to create better rules for U.S. businesses and better opportunity for our suppliers, including smaller suppliers, because new chapters on trade facilitation, cutting down barriers and red tape, both exporting and importing, because if you think of TPP, it's 40% of the world's GDP. It's a big agreement. Is it a perfect agreement? Absolutely not. There were things that a lot of businesses, as well as environmental groups and labor groups, wanted to see. But I think it's an awfully good agreement, and it would be a shame if the Congress weren't able to take it up soon. Speaking of trade facilitation, as you know, SIP is working with the uh, ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce, and the World Economic Forum. All all three of us are working together to implement part of the WTO's uh, trade facilitation agreement. And I know that's very important to Walmart. You just mentioned a couple of things about reducing red tape, cutting barriers. What does that really mean for a company like Walmart? We are so strongly supportive of, of the WTO trade facilitation agreement. I personally think... Sarah, quickly, can you kind of walk the listener through a little bit what that trade facilitation agreement sure. really it's is? It's actually sort of very dry. It's not a very exciting agreement, but we think it's a really important agreement. It's an agreement that uh, countries in the WTO committed to, to look at... What are our procedures for importing and exporting largely? Just simplifying it. But what are our customs procedures? How do we do things like advance notice and ruling? How long does it take for things to pass through our borders? Um, How do we help with capacity building for um, many countries that may not have had the ability to really invest in this in the past? Um, But, you know, what we see many times around the world is If you have customs officials that are working with lots of different papers, they may not, not only are people unable to get their goods in, but those small producers aren't able to get their goods out. Because if you can't import, it's really hard to export. Or you may have customs officials that are really controlling one way or another who can export and who can import. They have fees. They have fines. And that's at the border or is that done from the government or a little bit above? At the border with governments. All of them. And so this agreement should hopefully create more transparency in the processes. So what are your rules? Put them on the Internet. It sounds very simple, but not all countries do that. Does it help reduce corruption at the border too as well? We would hope. We would hope. You know, if you have an automated ruling – So no matter what, you put it in electronically and you get your ruling. Yes, this can come in. Here's the duty you need to pay. We would think that would take out that human Human element element. that sometimes can affect the ability to get a permit, to Mm -hmm. get a product in, to get a ruling. Um, And what we've seen is there's a really positive impact of investment in this area. You know, we use the port of Tangiers that's automated. Normally, I don't think we'd clear a lot through Tangiers, but we do because it works well. And the countries, Rwanda, that are investing in these, these landlocked countries. So you have empirical evidence to show that this really does it work. Does. It's, yeah. it's absolutely, these are investments that are in countries' interests because it should democratize trade. It shouldn't just be the big guys who can figure out, okay, if this port doesn't work, maybe I'll clear through here. Um, It should help everybody participate more fully in global trade. And hopefully in terms of dealing with corruption as well, because, you know, we've, we understand that that affects all businesses, right. but particularly small and medium-sized businesses, it could be even harder for them to deal with all the different hurdles that they have to go through. How do you think this agreement might help at that level as well? So again, as, as we hope, if the rules are clear, if they're largely automated, if anybody can access them, then I think it's harder for certain officials to say, you need to pay me X to get this faster. And I think in many countries... If those officials have that opportunity, if they're not paid well, if government services, it's a hard thing for people to get their arms around. But hopefully by making the right investments, that should reduce that. Well, we've even heard that there are companies that lose as much as a third or even more of their profits because of tariffs, because of these inefficiencies at the border. Do you see the same thing at, at Walmart where you could really make up a lot of ground financially if a lot of these rules are implemented? Absolutely. And I think the OECD has, some, has done some research this on the global impact in terms of the the reduction in cost of trade. And certainly we've seen for Walmart, when we've invested in our own technology, you know, we had to make some big investments to do electronic record keeping and electronic shipments, but then we can pre-clear so many more goods. It just, the cycle times go so much faster for us. And then also, you know, when you have clear 
pre-cleared manifest, I think there are other opportunities for people to have really much better risk management. So how do you know what shipments you should be targeting and opening? If I have a manifest three days ahead from a trusted trader that I know, then it's much easier to, to put my efforts at opening cargo and inspections on, well, I don't know what's in this. I don't know this trader. I've not seen them. And so hopefully some of these improvements that we've seen um, in the United States and around the world will help. And, and that increase in profits, you know, obviously leads to a better bottom line, but it also creates better investment for your company, more job creation. I mean, all of the above, I think. Right, but it's not just about us. It's, it's really about yeah, those smaller small companies and medium, yep. who may, you know, most SMEs, if they export, they export to one country. And there's a reason for that because exporting is hard. It's, it's very difficult for people to understand how to navigate some of these bigger rules if you don't have somebody, quite frankly, doing it for them. And I think... You know, that's why we see this really interesting phenomenon now of sort of the Internet enabling micro entrepreneurs to reach directly consumers. Well, why are they able to do that? Because the express delivery companies are essentially taking that trade portion and that export portion on their behalf for them. Now, if we could do that for businesses that want to connect to other businesses and consumers at scale, that would be pretty extraordinary because those micro multinationals are still pretty small. But there might be an SME here in the United States that could really expand if they could actually have markets in other economies that just are saying it's too hard for me. I can't do, do it. Do you see this as a doable solution then? I do. I think it's one of the smartest things to do. And that's why, you know, we're part of the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation, which is a unique new coalition that you're engaged in as well. That'll bring businesses, donor organizations and other countries together to say, what are the needs of these these countries around the world in terms of implementation of the trade facilitation agreement and how can we help advise? And something that's really exciting about that Global Alliance is the unique partnership between governments, between private sector, um, between donor, the donor community. Um, it's something really quite unique. Um, and so that's something that we were discussing the other day up in the Hill when we had that, that event with Senator Corker, um, the chairman of the U.S. Foreign Relations Committee. And there was and, a lot Julie, of excitement about it. just to let know, mm -hmm. uh, we held an event kind of to launch our, the TFA effort. Uh, right. Uh, in Senator Corker uh, and also uh, who was Ralph Carter. We had Carter senior representatives from, from uh, FedEx, FedEx and from USAID. USAID. Um, and th it's very exciting to hear that private sector perspective also being brought into the discussion where the private sector is able to say, we know really what is going on at the borders. We can really provide that unique perspective that you know we haven't always had in it these really kinds of solutions. It really is a public-private partnership. Yeah, sure. it really is. Sure. So that's something I'm sure that Walmart has, um, you know, finds exciting as well in terms of the uniqueness of that. We do. And, you know, we've had a long and very productive relationship with USAID. So it's it's not so new to us to mm -hmm. do this kind of best practice sharing. Um, we've been really pleased with our relationship. Um, we're partners of the Global Development Lab, which is really trying to think about how we do international development together um, and more strategically. And also to think about big ideas of collaboration mm -hmm. and coming up with new and innovative solutions. So Again, with the Global Alliance, you know, we hope to provide our expertise on the ground. So we're trying to move horticulture products around sub-Saharan Africa. Those are pretty hard products to move. They're perishable. You need to get your certificates quickly. You need to move some of these products inland over land. So you're seeing a lot of border stops. So we can tell, you know, we know that that's expertise that we have that we can help hopefully shape some projects with um, development assistance money. And I think deciding on what countries to work at and work in and what areas of focus will be really helpful. Well, Sarah, we're running out of time. I just want to ask you one last question. Uh, for the listeners out there, what's the most important issue really facing Walmart, say, in the next 12 months or so, especially when it comes to trade? Uh, gosh, we're such a big organization, so I would hate so to many choose among So many <laughs> issues. <laughs> But you mentioned Certainly TFA, TPP, TPP, passage, TPP yeah. TFA implementation. I worry somewhat about the future of the WTO. So I think the Nairobi ministerial and thinking about... Which is coming up, uh, so I think, starting next Monday, I right. believe, yeah. The thinking about how to make sure the WTO is relevant to business um, is really important because as much as we love the bilateral and multi, you know, the regional solutions, TPP, TTIP, all of these acronyms, a multilateral solution is truly the best for us. So how we make sure that the WTO is still relevant is still working on an agenda that helps businesses of all size and economies of all sizes is, is really important. And 
Um, so we're hopeful for a good outcome in Nairobi. And then, you know, continuing, I think, from a, my personal perspective, a trade perspective, to sort of demystify trade because it becomes so divisive in the United States. And I think it's true there are winners and losers, but I think there are ways to have a more inclusive trade agenda that is addressing a lot of the issues that many different sides care about. I think the TPP does that. It has a very strong labor chapter. Uh, you know it's uh, a chapter that people that, that when people on both sides are finding trouble with it, it's probably a good balance. It has very strong protections for the environment as well as benefits from small businesses and large businesses. So getting that passed is going to be particularly important. Uh, and then thinking about the future growth of the U.S. trade agenda. Well, thanks so much, Sarah. It was really great that you came by. I mean, we really yes. enlightened us on a lot, lot of subjects. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. It's yeah. so fun to talk and, about. and for those that don't know, Sarah's been involved with SITE before. She was on a panel uh, on SDGs. Yes, Sustainable Just, Development Goals. Yeah, it was yeah. which you mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. And she was terrific on that. So I hope she comes back for more because we, we got plenty of stuff for her to There's do There's always here, more so. to talk about. I'm happy to be here. Exactly. So thanks so much. Take care. We'll see you next week. You've been listening to Democracy That Delivers. For more information about the Center for International Private Enterprise, please go to our website at sipe.org. That's C-I-P-E dot org. Thanks for listening.